Hello, welcome everybody. All right, so uh, really, thanks so much for coming out today. Uh, got a great panel here. Uh, folks, I'm just honored to be standing within five feet of, uh, who will introduce in a minute. We're here today to talk about uh, how to win ranked choice voting in your state legislature. So, um, <laughs> so these folks are the pros. They've They've done it, come close to doing it, uh, are on track to do it, and uh, you know th there's a lot we can all learn from them. Uh, I'm especially happy for folks who are working working on ranked choice voting in states that don't have ballot measures. That uh, this will be important for all of us, but especially for you folks. So without further ado, we'll get started. Uh, we're going to kick it off with some quick intros. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, thank you all for being here today. My name is Mike Alfoni. Uh, he, him. Uh, I'm from Oregon. I founded Oregon Ranked Choice Voting Advocates, um, and we're a group that is helping build and facilitate the coalition supporting ranked choice voting in Oregon. I'm also really excited because, uh, and excuse me if I'm a little nostalgic here, but uh, it's been a long time since I've been held captive under a spotlight in a concrete room, um, and it was under much different circumstances as a teenager, so I really appreciate being here today. Uh, That's funny. Well, hello, reformers. How y'all doing? We were just conversing beforehand. Even five years ago, we would like fill the first two aisles in a chair on a topic like ranked choice voting. And here we are filling up a room. So a round of applause for all of you. It is the most affirming thing every single time it happens. Whenever ranked choice voting gets set on a stage by someone important, it gets the loudest applause in the room. <laughs> and it keeps going, and it's just for all of us to know that we've got the growing support in the political community and the celebrity community and the voting community. It's just so rewarding, and it's exciting to be on this stage talking about the kind of progress that we're making, laying the foundation for every other state here in the nation. So we couldn't be more excited. I'm Jean Massey. I'm the executive director of Fair Vote. Minnesota, I've been at this for a while, probably longer than most of you in the room since 2006 when we passed the campaign in Minneapolis and continued to grow the movement in Minnesota, and I'm excited to share that story. Hello, everyone. Hello. Aloha. Aloha. This is great. So I'm Stan Lockhart. Um, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Have a one fan out there. Um, uh, I'm from Utah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so I've uh, I've been involved in the political process for 35 years or so in the state of Utah, and uh, have served in elected office. I'm the former chairman of the Utah Republican Party. I've been on the state school board. I was on a city council, the second largest city in the state. My late wife, Becky, was the only woman to ever be Speaker of the House, and she served 16 years in our state legislature. And so, and I'm a lobbyist by profession. So I have a little bit of experience here, and um, hopefully I can share what I've learned. All right. So. Uh, it's going to be a real simple panel. We really got you one. Introduce yourself. Oh, Nathan Lockwood, Executive Director of Rank the Vote. Uh, I want to. <laughs> wow. I, yeah, I, I, I'm speechless. This is amazing. Uh, so what was I going to say? Oh, so anyways, I want to thank the previous two moderators who tried to get here, but you know, COVID claimed them uh, temporarily uh, beforehand. So if something happens to me uh, during this panel, it truly is cursed. But we're going to start out with a real simple question, and that was going to be: You were going to get Terrence Carroll, former Speaker of the House in Colorado, and just you know, uh, in uh, I forget his exact position at Fairvote, Senior Principal at Fairvote. Uh, who would have been a great moderator for this panel. I think we all agree. Uh, and then Ashley Houghton, uh, director of almost everything else at Fairvote. And uh, 
she wasn't feeling well. She felt like she got COVID the next night. So thanks for having me here. Real simple panel. We're going to ask each of our panelists uh, what they have done to win or try to win ranked choice voting through the state legislature in their state. And we're going to start with Jean Massey. Thank you, Stan. Or, sorry. Nathan. 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 I do know you too. Um, well, I think I'll just give a little bit of background and take, you, take us back to how the whole movement started in Minnesota. For those of you who are just getting started, maybe getting this going at a local level, we knew in Minnesota it's a brand new idea. Going to the state would never be possible. Now, actually, it is. So that's exciting for the movement. But in Minnesota, what we knew is that California had just started doing ranked choice voting in the Bay Area. And we believed in Minnesota, um, and I had this conviction that, well, if San Francisco can do it, so can Minneapolis, right? <laughs> well, about 100 coffee conversations later, that was validated. But of course, it took 100 coffee conversations or more with all the community and political partners possible to have that analysis and make that happen. And a shout out to the League of Women Voter organizations that have done critical studies. <laughs> on alternative voting systems, that's what they did in Minnesota, and I know they've been done in other states to say that ranked choice voting is actually a really good way to go if you're not gonna do the current system. So we built on that study. We did the campaign in Minneapolis, won it two to one in a really strong turnout year and kept going the course. St. Paul quickly followed. We did have a diversion to the Supreme Court as some of you uh, may have had in your states. Someone wants to prove that ranked choice voting is illegal all the time, and they're not, never going to stop doing that. We had that in Minnesota, went to the Supreme Court. It was a unanimous opinion by the court that ranked choice voting is fully constitutional. So let them keep trying. Don't let them stop you from uh, using that argument. And then it took a few years to really get the implementation system underway and get to have it honed. And then quickly followed in the late uh, eight, by eight, 2018 and then 2020, we had three more suburban communities adopting ranked choice voting, all very successful implementations across the board. The election officials responsible for all of these really leaned in on that opportunity and do a kick-ass job on implementing ranked choice voting. That's not true everywhere, but I would say to the credit of election administrators, almost everywhere, they really do lean in and do their work well. They take a lot of pride and they don't want any missteps. So when we help get it over the finish line, they really are our partners um, on the other side, if not during the process. So for all of you who are working at the local level, partner with administrators to the best extent possible. Well, after all of that, uh, growth and opportunity, we knew that we couldn't do a whole lot more even at a local level until we had legislation passed. The five communities that have it in Minnesota have two things in common, very little else. That is, they have a city charter and they have off-year elections, so it doesn't beg the question of how do we put a ranked election in an even-year ballot with presidential and state offices. So. We need legislation to allow any jurisdiction, which is most, that hold elections in even years. And we need to grant authority to those that don't have a charter to also use ranked choice voting. We are very close in the last legislative session, passing a local options bill and creating a very strong pathway to ranked choice voting statewide through a study process. We didn't get everything we wanted, so we'll be back at the next session for sure passing the local options bill and then waiting for a study to come forward from the Secretary of State on how we will do this statewide. What did pass in the last session was a study bill. And it was a really strong, robust conversation at the legislature, one that had never happened before. However, we went in with higher expectations. And we went in with higher expectations because we had done so much ground laying in the work. And what I want to describe to you Today is the candidate program that we enacted in order to achieve these goals and to continue to achieve goals legislatively. It wasn't possible, we believed, for the legislature to just wake up and love an idea like ranked choice voting. We've heard a lot of that kind of conversation in these rooms today that it takes the kind of grassroots work that we're all doing to raise awareness, educate, pressure, advocate and make sure that we're creating the friends that we need. 
while we were making progress legislatively, we just never felt it would be enough unless we invested in electoral work. And that's a big question. Most of us have C3s or C4 organizations, and we're comfortable in that space as nonprofit, nonpartisan, quote unquote, organizations. And doing PAC work is really out of line with what most of us do, but it's absolutely essential work. We knew that Minnesota had the opportunity to create a trifecta that could pass ranked choice voting. That's a partisan strategy. It is the Democratic Party that was necessary to pass this. The GOP in Minnesota has jumped on the bandwagon, sadly, but that's where it is, and that's not something we can change overnight. But we know we've got enough friends on the Democratic side to pass this if they have the trifecta. Organizationally, we raised resources and created a strategy that was three-pronged. The first and most important was that we would uh, door knock for candidates, that we would identify candidates who were supportive of ranked choice voting. We would survey all the candidates and make sure that they were fully in support of ranked choice voting, and we awarded them a badge, a democracy badge, or an endorsement, for lack of a better word. And we had a slate of endorsed candidates, and we publicized those endorsements. Then we took it to the next step and said, who really needs the help? It's not candidates in safe districts. It's going to be candidates in swing districts, where we know we can pick up those seats with pro-democracy candidates who would support ranked choice voting legislation. And they committed to that process. So we did that, and at the end of the, uh, of the uh, election year, we door knocked as an organization over 30,300 doors. It was the most that any organization had done. It was huge, but it was so much fun. And now, you can do it in one of two ways. You can do it fully independently and do that through a C4, or you can do it in a coordinated fashion with candidates through a PAC. We believe that we wanted to build the relationships with those candidates and coordinate. So we raised money into the PAC so we could hire a few organizers, recruit a whole bunch of volunteers, and door knock incessantly <laughs> every single day. And we did that with leadership. So if the speaker said, we're doing a day of a 1,000 doors with candidate A, we showed up. We showed up every time there was a leader in the, in the door knock to make sure that they were aware. And then, sure enough, soon enough, it was a phone call from the speaker, so what are you doing on Saturday? <laughs> Can you bring your orange shirts? Absolutely, we were there. We just kept showing up, and that commitment was obvious to everybody because we didn't just let them know at the door knock. We advertised and advertised and promoted everything we did. So Twitter and Facebook and Instagram was always full of lots of orange shirts everywhere. We modeled, I think this is important for some of you who may be familiar with their work, we modeled our program after Moms Demand. We saw in 2018 that they were at the doors with their red shirts, and I thought, that's exactly what we need to do. And then we hired the coordinator from Moms Demand to work with us <laughs> to lay out the program, and it was so effective. We also raised money into the PAC to help do some financing for candidates who needed that support. And then we raised some money to, uh, to help uh, uh, the caucuses as well. Those are all layers. You can decide how, what strategies are most important for your work. But all of that meant that we knew where the commitments were at the end of the election year. We weren't going into the legislature with a question mark. We had the commitment of the leadership in the caucuses, the speaker, the majority leader, the governor. Everybody was on board. And that felt really good, and we went in with a really strong bill. However, there were a few people, you know, that, that were, were not quite ready to go statewide. And so the whole conversation got a bit stalled. We'll be back, but we needed to detangle, really, the local option bill from the statewide, have the statewide go through the study process, and then uh, pass a local options bill, which we believe will be happening in the next session. So we're making good progress, but again, we didn't make the progress we needed. What that means for our candidate work is we'll be back at it. We'll be electing more pro-RCV candidates. We'll be cementing the commitment. The kind of support that we can give in um, 
The legislature is just so key. And when you prove that you can do that work, it creates the relationships with the candidates and the commitment from leadership that's necessary to pass these kinds of bills. Now, you're going to hear from Oregon, all of that work wasn't necessary. That's a gift. But if we believe that we have to continue to win legislative victories, we're going to have to move our work upstream and start at the candidate side and not just expect that at grassroots advocacy will be enough to convince a legislative body and a governor that this is the right step to take. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Jean. Um, and real quick, uh, how, if people want to learn more about this, what's the best way for them to, uh, to, to get additional information on this subject? Email. Just email us and we can work with you. We have everything documented. It's not publicly available on a website. You can, Im you can imagine that. So just uh, let us know and we can share some resources with you. We've got candidate surveys. We've got all the tools you will need. The strategy, candidate survey, uh, social media kit, the badges, the endorsements, all those graphics. Happy to lend whatever might make sense for you. All right, thanks so much, Gene. All right, let's hear it one more time for Gene. All right, and I'm gonna hand it over to Mike. Here you go, Mike. Hey, Smith. I'm glad I'm in the middle here. I'm having a little bit of imposter syndrome from people who've uh, put a lot more work in, uh, according, according to Gene, at least. Uh, yeah. Um, so again, I'm Mike. Uh, I started Oregon Ranked Choice Voting Advocates, um, and we uh, successfully got ranked choice voting through our state legislature for all federal and statewide offices this past cycle, which was kind of exciting. Um, we also, if you didn't know what happened, also passed the first proportional representation uh, enactment in the country in something like, I don't know, 50, 80, 100 years, something like that, in the city of Portland, Oregon, which is also kind of a big deal. Um, so that was cool. Uh, it's been a year. Um, and then we had a fight with city council on defense while ramping up for a statewide ballot measure because our legislature referred it to the ballot. Um, so much like, you know, I think Alaska stood on the shoulders of Maine, who stood on the shoulders of everyone who's been working on this, passing it locally for years, we are hoping to take, we were hoping to take a next step and get a legislature to take action and prove that's possible, and we're psyched that we did. Who I'm hoping someone is sitting in this room who's the next person to just skip that part of it and just get the legislature just to do the damn thing. Uh, because I think there's 32 states that don't even have ballot measures. So if we're going to kind of build change from the state level up, we kind of need, you know, slightly more than three-fifths of the rest of the country to be able to kind of do this stuff, I think. I'm not great at math, but um, that seems less than 100% if not everybody has ballot measures. So, uh, glad you're all here. Um, I'm going to give you two answers on how we did it. Uh, the, the, starting with the short one. The short one is, uh, for at least Oregon, you're at the wrong talk. Please come to the five o'clock talk where it is how to win RCV through coalition building, uh, where Sol, uh, who is the obviously director of the Coalition of Communities of Color, uh, who is the campaign manager for the Portland effort and the coalition chair for uh, the RCV movement in Oregon, um, was instrumental. And uh, you can come at five o'clock uh, because that's, that's where I think a lot of the wisdom about what we did is gonna happen. However, I'm supposed to keep talking, so I will. Uh, I warned you that I keep talking. Uh, so uh, I worked with, uh, anybody here see Dan Rayfield, the speaker, the politician guy who's talking this morning? Yeah, he's, he's great. Um, and he's right, is that I think, you know, I come from a background, uh, I'm, a, you know, I, I'm gonna throw up in my mouth saying these words, uh, like you might call me a political operative, um, and as much as I hate those words, I'm probably closer to that than I am an activist. And I think that the theory of change here was that in 2016, then just newly minted state representative Dan Rayfield and I and this fellow Blair Bowie got together and we did 
Rentridge voting in Benton County, Oregon. And the theory was is to prove it, pilot it, and then move it forward statewide. And, you know, it was sort of, we did it, it was great. There was no real formal plan moving forward. It kind of, we all drifted and did other things. And then in 2019, and, um, and it wasn't just because I was unemployed, I was like, I think I'm gonna get this moving on the statewide level in Oregon. So I, I decided to found a group, brought them back in. We kind of got together, the three of us, and started working on it. And the theory of change after discussion here was really that like, we're never gonna have the legitimacy as this just like startup wonky group pushing this thing that virtually nobody has heard of that has a confusing name where votes are transferred around or something. Um, and so we need to start education and we need to mainstream it. Uh, and the way we went about doing this was, I think it's, it looks probably very different than a lot of the ways that it's gonna have to be done elsewhere and a lot of ways that others are doing it, is that um, I wanted to run something that was uh, much more of an inside baseball effort. So, and I don't mean like just consummate insider stuff, I mean like working with existing political organizations, working with legislators, working with people who work in politics, and starting to really build, like find the few people who supported it and cobble together with them something bigger each time. So it was still the same idea of organizing, but working within the grass tops rather than starting from the grassroots. And over time, the coalition came together. Um, I think ultimately, we our coalition spanned 40-something organizations, representing about 10% of the voting population in Oregon. We had uh, two out of the three largest unions in the state and much other labor support. Uh, our coalition was led by coalitions of communities of color and organizations that represented culturally specific groups, BIPOC organizations, um, youth, uh, League of Women Voters, good government groups. It was a very broad, diverse coalition, uh, organizations that represented rural constituencies. Uh, we did our best to create a large group of organizations who uh, were used to being politically active and then actually bringing in and working to train on politics other organizations that wanted to start working more in the state legislature or otherwise. And uh, we did this through trying to be collaborative. Instead of just walking up to people with policy papers and be like, hey, look at our great idea, like on paper, because it turns out people get a lot of that in politics. We really made a best effort to be friends with everyone, to support, go to other people's fundraisers, to support the work of newly evolved, emerging organizations who may not have done this before, but you know, instead of hiring our own staff, re-granting money to them, re-granting money to other organizations for their staff work, because this isn't free for them. And we ended up, instead of running this sort of hierarchical campaign manager, you know, deputy, field director, communications director thing that might have been built over time, um, we instead went horizontally and ended up um, funding the organizations who existed before us, who will exist after us, who represent real people, and working together with them to think through what election reforms exist that can help advance the, uh, the agendas of those organizations, specifically the people who are most impacted by election reform. And so we spent a year working on a policy roundtable, working with existing structures that work on ballot measures that work on the legislature, talking and talking and talking about these policies. And I wanna emphasize this point because if you're anything like me, and I'm guessing many of you are because you wouldn't be doing this, you might have a short attention span and just wanna get things done now all the time. Uh, and I'm, you know, it's gonna be different in every state, uh, but it's, I think, unlikely to be fast. And so we spent a lot of time getting buy-in by having people own this and own it more than we did. Our organization was never the face of this, and that was very intentional. Organizations that uh, represented real people, that have real, uh, you know, that have real relationships and have a brand with our legislators and in the public eye, they're put forward, they drive the decision making, they were crafting policy. You know, we would be advising things, we were obviously in the room, but never at any point was Oregon RCV ever intended to be a brand, a campaign. It was always intended to be an organization that supports the work of others. Uh, and through building, I think, one of the largest coalitions ever assembled around RCV, we were able to get into the state legislature, we were able to get people to listen to us, we had to have meetings, we, you know, we don't talk a lot about this, we ran a failed effort in 2021, but a lot of people after that knew what RCV was. And then, uh, and I, I wanna emphasize something Jean says because it's very important and I think as reformers, we don't, we kinda wanna shy away from this. We got some PAC money, you know, it was a lot of money to probably a lot of us in the room, but in terms of a PAC it wasn't, it was $50,000. But that $50,000, allowed us to meet with a lot of our overworked part-time legislators who don't have time to talk to everybody who are desperately trying to raise money for their campaigns, uh, who have to have all their day jobs too because we have a part-time legislature, which by the way is messed up and we should change that. Um, it allowed us to get more meetings the summer before the 2023 session with legislators than we had during our 2021 session 
at all on RCV. Um, and, and that's just the reality of it. And so I think one of the things we went into is with a, just a, what is the political reality on the ground? Not just like our idea is good and that we want the, you know, the idea, the weight of the idea is gonna carry it on itself. It, it doesn't work like that. So we did the work and I would, I would uh, you know, encourage everyone not to think cynically about it, but just like it's hard to run for office and you've got to be careful with your time. You can't just talk to everyone. You can't take everyone seriously. Like you've got to use things like who, what, who do my friends think, uh, you know, what, what do my friends think about this issue? The politicians are gonna think the same thing, but like what does the labor union say or what does the farm bureau say or whoever that politician listens to? You have to make allies and you have to be willing to be like policy compromises and you have to be willing to talk to people who this policy actually affects and affects more than you and let them take the lead on it. And you may not love the result. Like we don't include legislative races in our thing, which a lot of us don't love, but you know what? We wouldn't have won if we'd included them. So I think, you know, just going through that process of not being the ones in charge, being willing to give away power, being willing to be a good ally, being willing to have the patience to talk through these things, and being willing to go through the messy process of working with other human beings in large groups, it was really critical to our win. Those are great inspirational stories. And um, I've got a great inspirational story too, but as I've been listening to the conversation, um, and because you guys are so great and responsive to us, I thought that maybe I could um, share it in a little different way. They all did exactly what they needed to do. If you're taking notes, take those notes. Try to follow the, the blueprint and you'll do just fine. There are two components. There's actually something called a legislative process. It's a really well-defined process that allows you to pass bills and get appropriations. And in our state, it is ruled by the law of 38, 15, and 1, which is more than 50% in the House, more than 50% in the Senate, and the governor's signature. And sometimes we get involved in all the grassroots stuff and we think that if we take a large group of people up to the legislature and spend the day talking to people, we're gonna get something done. And rarely does that result in legislative success. Now, I don't wanna discourage you. If that's all you have, then, then take it and run with it. But there's, this, there's a very well-defined process on how you get bills passed. I felt like I, I, I really felt like I was a kid again and I was watching ABC cartoons on Saturday morning with Schoolhouse Rock. A bill, a bill, and, and I, really we need to talk about how to get a bill passed because that's really the essence of what we're trying to do. So um, to get a bill passed, it takes two things. The first thing it takes is the trust of legislators. And you do not get that trust going up one day and having a conversation with them. You get that trust uh, after talking to them over and over again, helping in a campaign, uh, attending their, their cottage meetings or their town hall meetings, um, calling them on the phone with issues and having conversations, finding ways to help them when they need your help, which is mostly during campaign time when they're trying to get elected. But somehow you have to develop trust in that group of people that are gonna vote on these issues. And if you don't have that trust, I don't care how loud you are, you're not gonna get stuff done. Okay, so that's the first component. Second component, you've gotta get them something that they believe is important enough that they wanna pass a bill. Because there are a lot of great things to talk about, but if you can't define the problem, if you can't define the issue and why it's important, then even if you have all their trust, you may not get a bill passed. So those are the two things. You've gotta be able to, it's gotta be a compelling enough issue that they want to act on it as a legislature and you have gotta have their trust. So that's, that's why lobbyists exist, people, because the lobbyists have spent the time necessary to develop those relationships and they know those legislators well enough that they know the types of things that they will consider important enough to want to pass a bill. So that's why, that's why lobbyists exist. And frankly, this country was founded on all of us becoming lobbyists. It's just we don't all have the time to go get to know every legislator 
on a first name basis. So you hire people to do that. Now, I need to say this to you. In the state of Utah, there's probably at least a thousand lobbyists. Out of those thousand lobbyists, there might be a quarter of them, maybe 250 of them, that get paid to do it. And out of that 250, there's probably 100 that actually know the process well enough that they can pass bills. And out of that 100, there's probably 10 of them that are talking to leadership the night before a bill needs to be passed. OK? So, so when you say the word lobbyist, a lobbyist is not a lobbyist. Is not, I mean, they're not the same. And so your goal, if you decide that you've got enough money to go hire a lobbyist, is to find the ones that have the most influence with the legislators in the key positions that can help get this passed. And by the way, you don't have to know all legislators to get something passed. You need to know members of leadership. You need to know chairmen of committee. Um, but, but you can know essentially you know, one-tenth of the legislators well and still get stuff done. So you don't have to know everybody. So, um, so as you go through this process, um, in my state, I'm going to tell you the process in Utah, and, and, and it is all modeled after the federal government. Our federal government is modeled after England. We just ended up with a two-party system, frankly, was the major difference. And then um, all the states, as much as they're alike, they're so different. So if I were to go to Ohio with my Ohio friends, I would be like entering a foreign land where you're driving on the wrong side of the road because it's that much different in, in Ohio than it is in Utah. But, so I'm going to give you Utah. And it's, I'm just going to simplify it down to a bill, a bill, whatever. So you have an idea. It's a compelling problem. You try to figure out what area in the, what, what committees in the legislature might want to solve that problem. If you can, find a committee chair. And in, in our state, it's government operations that handles elections. So I want to find the chair, either the House chair or the Senate chair of government operations to run my bill. And if I can't get them, then it's the vice chair. If I can't get them, it's one of the members of the committee. And then I go ask them, I go talk to them about this issue and ask them if they'll run the bill. By the way, that is easy. Almost always a legislator will say, yeah, sure, I'll run a bill. And, and, if, and if you've got enough time, they'll go get it drafted and they'll have it ready for, this, for the session. So then once the bill is drafted, it goes to your fiscal analyst and they put a fiscal note on it. And if nobody, and if, and if people generally don't want it to pass, they'll put some big fiscal note on there to make sure that it can't pass. But after it gets the fiscal note and, it, and people look at, at, at the, the attorneys in the, in the dra bill drafting center are looking at the constitutionality of it, then pretty soon it gets numbered. And then that begins the process. So the legislature is now in session. The bill has a number. And in our, it, let's just say it goes through the House, it goes into first reading. And the first reading is it go, they send it to rules. And then it sits in rules until the speaker and the rules chair decide it's time to bring it out. And then they send it to a committee. And if they don't want it to pass, it goes to a committee you've never heard of. And if, it, and if they want to give it a shot, they'll send it to the committee where it should be held. And in our case, it'd be government operations. Once it's in government operations, then you've got to persuade the chair to put it on the agenda. And so you persuade them to put it on the agenda. Then you've got to persuade the majority of members on that committee to vote in favor of the bill. And that means that you need to have relationships of trust with each member of that committee, if at all possible. And if I don't have that relationship of trust, I find it, try to find somebody in my group who does. Who likes ranked choice voting and help me talk to that person? And then we go talk to them. And by the time the vote happens, my job as a lobbyist is to know the vote before I walk into the room. It doesn't, I'm just telling you, the testimony in committee, it may matter a little bit, but not a lot. What matters is the work you do getting into that committee. And then, of course, you've got to have powerful testimony in the committee, otherwise, you know, you're in trouble, but that's not where the decisions are made, frankly. So let's just say it passes. So now you get the majority of votes in the committee and it passes out of committee. Now it goes to the floor and it gets in line with all the other bills that have been sent to the floor. So you might not hear it on the floor for a week 
particularly early in a legislative session. Am I boring you? Okay, okay, is this what you want to hear? Okay, all right, okay, so we're, we're good, we're good, okay. So when it comes to the floor, the sponsor of the bill is going to get up and introduce that bill. And then there's going to be this robust debate, and it's going to go back and forth. And you're going to be wishing you had talked to that legislator who's talking against it. Because I've had that happen many times where I'm like, oh no, why did we not talk to that person? And then you've got to get more than 50%. We have 75 House members. If it's coming from the House, I've got to get 38 votes. And when those votes are being counted, I am dying a thousand deaths until they get to 38. Okay? So once you get through that, let's say it all happens and it passes, you would think you can claim victory, but no. Now you got to go to the other body in the Senate, or depending on where it starts, but you got to go to the other body and do exactly the same thing. Okay? And then at the end of this process, if you do not have, if you've not, if, if you've not convinced leadership to fund the fiscal note on the bill, and they, they love to put fiscal notes on ranked choice voting bills because they got to, they got to improve the election system. They got to buy more equipment. And that equipment isn't, isn't good enough, so we got to get the very best of the best, right? So watch out for that fiscal note, because you can go through all this and have success and get to the end, and if it's not funded, the bill does not pass, okay? Then it goes to the governor's office, and now you got to go talk to the governor's people and make sure that he's either willing to sign it or let it go into law without signing. And if you go through all of those steps, then you have success. So we've done that in Utah. We've done it several times. And, um, and I can tell you that I've got relationships where when legislators have questions about ranked choice voting, they call me. Stan, here's what I'm hearing. What's up with that? And I'm glad they do. I'm glad that they call me and they trust me. Now, there are some headwinds nationally that are causing Republicans to not like ranked choice voting. And we have those same headwinds in Utah. And we're fighting for our very existence right now. But I can tell you, we've probably passed four bills, five bills in the last six years. And, um, and we're really proud of the work that we've done. And if you look at the, our local option bill that we passed where we had, okay, here's the other thing. Sometimes you have to accept less than you really want in order to succeed long-term. It's called incrementalism. And I'll be frank with you, Democrats are great at it and Republicans suck at it, okay? But incrementalism works. And so um, what we decided as a group is that, because, because there, uh, there, there were a lot of skeptics on, will ranked choice voting work with Utah voters? I mean, we got polls all over the country saying how well it works, but is it gonna work with our voters? And it's a legitimate policy question. And so how do, you, how do you figure out if it works before you implement it? You, you, you do a pilot. And so we chose a city option pilot where the cities proactively get to decide to opt in. And so we passed that pilot in 2018. Um, and by the way, that was after a lot of conversations with those opposed to ranked choice voting in our state Senate. And, and after going through it in great detail and talking about what the various possibilities are, we all agreed that, that doing a city option pilot was, was, the, was the way to do it. And so the first year we had two cities. And we would have had more, but the county clerks rebelled against us. And it, it was like, uh, it was just kind of a weird deal where everybody was for it, and we were holding hands singing Kumbaya, and the next thing you know, they're all against it. And you're like, what happened? And, um, but we found one county clerk who was willing to run it. And her elections director is sitting here today, Josh Daniels. And we should give him a round of applause. <laughs> Josh is one of our rock stars. His boss said, he, she put a great tagline on ranked choice voting after the first election, better, faster, cheaper. And we've really hung on to that, that, that uh, slogan because it so quickly tells people what ranked choice voting is all about compared to plurality voting. 
So first year, two cities did it. We did polling afterwards. In fact, the county clerk did po polling afterwards. 84% of the voters in, uh, collectively loved ranked choice voting and wanted to use it again. Success. Two years later, 23 cities opted in. Over 40% of Utah voters had a chance to use ranked choice voting in their city elections in 2021. And um, actually, three cities didn't have enough people file, so we only, used, we only had 20. Huge success, a few glitches. Well, why, how could you have glitches? Ranked choice voting, so awesome. Well, here's the deal, people. Ranked choice voting is not perfect. It is better than plurality voting. And, when, and, and if you make perfection the enemy of better, you're gonna fail. So the way to pitch this is not that this is a silver bullet that's gonna solve all election problems and get rid of polarization in America. That is not what we're doing. We are trying to do something better than we have today. And ranked choice voting is better than what we have today, okay? How much more time do I have? One minute to wrap up. Okay, I got one minute to wrap up. Okay, great. What can I say in a minute? <laughs> uh, two minutes, okay. So, um, so then this year, with headwinds coming, Sarah Palin loses, blames it on ranked choice voting. We all know she's universally hated in Alaska. That's why she lost. Um, but, but she blamed it on ranked choice voting. And Donald Trump came to town and said, ranked choice voting sucks because Sarah Palin lost. And, uh, and, and, and the next thing you know, across the country, Republicans are saying ranked choice voting sucks. Can I say that? Oh, okay. All right. Sorry about that. Um, it's not true. Ranked choice voting is better than what we have. And, and I, can, I can have that debate with you all day, every day, but most people don't want to know and they don't care. They just want to listen to their party tell them it's not great. And so as we're going through that in Utah, it, it's, it's a hard slog right now. And um, I'll stand up and defend ranked choice voting any day of the week, though, because it helps improve elections, and elections are so fundamental to our, to our representative form of government. I mean, truly, it's the one chance we have as citizens to weigh in on how we're governed. We've got to have the very best. We've got to have voters show up. They need to be educated. They need to be informed. They need, they need to have options. Ranked choice voting does all those things in, in, a, in a way that honors the integrity of the process. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much to our panelists. Uh, so now it's the Q&A section, and I'm going to turn it over to our room leader here, who's going to take the microphone around. Just raise your hand. Hey, I have a question for Jean. Um, I was wondering how you went, set about um, kind of setting up a firewall between your C3 side and the PAC side. Like, I'm just not familiar with the setting up of a PAC or like what's involved in that as far as, and I figure different organizations might be interested in kind of how you went about that. Uh, so the question was building a firewall between PAC work and C3, C4 work. The PAC was created independent of the organization, and our board had nothing to do with it organizationally. So we hired a political strategist to basically run the PAC, and most of the work that was done through the PAC was uh, recruiting volunteers. And what, what we needed to do, and you have to research the laws in your state, comply with all the campaign finance laws. So we learned them. We hired an attorney to make sure that we didn't misstep in understanding what those rules uh, were, and then followed through in making sure that if we were going to use any staff time, that that was uh, recorded as a campaign finance contribution. So you can use staff. You just have to re record it as that activity and not hide the fact that you're doing it, and so that's part of building that wall. But we had an independent committee, an independent bank account, independent reporting of those expenses, and uh, just made sure that we got all of our campaign finance reports in on time and properly recorded. I'll admit that it's not necessarily easy 
to kind of track all those expenses and get it right on a campaign finance report. You do want to hire some attorneys to walk you through that process, review those reports, get them in, and call the campaign finance board. Build that relationship so they trust the work that you're doing. And if you have a question, fair enough. It's complex law. So know those rules and set it up properly. And uh, it, it, it was the most effective tool we had in our toolbox, for sure. We could have done it independently as a C4, send out door knockers on behalf of candidates without their knowledge whatsoever. But again, you're not building the relationship and the trust that Sam was talking about that's necessary to really have the conversations when you're back at the legislature. So I would, if you can do a PAC, do it, but it's not absolutely essential if that's not within your strategy. Uh, I just want to emphasize the, the, the point that Jean made called get a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> do not DIY this. Do not DIY this and do not DIY a ballot title or a piece of legislation. You may be smart. I know a lot of the people in this room are very smart. Do not do this without consultation with people who have done these things before and have some kind of degree that I would never be able to get myself. Uh, I just want to underscore those things. And if you can't afford an attorney, you're, you don't have enough PAC money for it to make a difference anyways. You're not ready. Um, the other advantage of having a PAC that's known in the community is that legislators and candidates know you're going to be back doing the work again the next cycle. And that expectation of they're not going away, they're going to be around, they're going to be having these conversations with us, and we can get their help because I love ranked choice voting as a candidate. So that knowledge is important, and having a physical PAC sets that expectation in the right way. Yeah. On the subject of incrementalism, uh, sometimes incrementalism can assist eventual ultimate success. Sometimes it can deflate momentum and freeze you at halfway where you want to get. In the RCV area, comparing local option voting as opposed to uh, RCV only within part, party primaries, respective primaries, do you have an opinion on which is the more, uh, which is the less successful path for ultimate success if you have to go incremental? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really good point, right? Um, if you can get the whole enchilada, get it, right? I mean, if you can, if you can, Mike, I would say Mike went big and got it. Gene has been at this for 20 years, 25 years. You've been at this forever. Uh, 15. 15, okay. <laughs> I'm in dangerous territory and I don't know how to get out of it. <laughs> Um, so, so you need to assess the situation and, go, and get what you can get, because you're absolutely right. Right now we worry about getting our pilot renewed because of, because of the headwinds that are coming to us. And if we could have gotten more earlier, maybe we could have bypassed that, right? So, so to your point, incre incrementalism does work, but you've got to be very strategic and get as much as you can get when you can get it. The party route. Yep. Yeah, okay. So we did that. So that's the Utah story. In about 1997 or 8 or 6, um, conservatives, grassroots activists, and the Republican Party came to the Central Committee and said, we want to use this in party conventions. And I was a part of the establishment, and I said, if they're in favor of it, I'm against it. Heck no. We are not going there. Because, I mean, really, if they said up, I'd say down. If they said black, I'd say white. If they said fast, I'd say slow. And that's what happens with the establishment and your grassroots. I mean, that's the way it works, right? So um, I, we fought against it and fought against it and fought against it. And in 2000, we used it for the first time. And a 10-hour convention went to three and a half hours. What's not to like about that, I said. <laughs> and so off and on over the years, we had used it in our conventions and they had actually funneled down to using it in caucus meetings as well on the Republican side. 
And then the Democrats started using it after the Republicans started using it, which is kind of interesting, right? And then they started bringing legislation, they started getting bill sponsors, and they couldn't get it out of rules for six years. So going the party route does not get you, at least for us, it did not get us to where we needed to be. It got us attention, it got us bills. It just didn't get anything passed, okay? The local option, uh, our, the most conservative House member and the most liberal House member in our legislature co-sponsored a ranked choice voting bill. They got 57 to 17 was the vote in the House, and overnight it became an issue in Utah. It wasn't an issue, and then that bill passed on the House floor, and it was an issue. And then it went to Senate committee and died on a 3 to 3 vote. So I go to senators. What's up with that? Well, we don't know how, I mean, we're not confident that Utah voters will figure this thing out. So we work with them and we get the local option because that's what we could get. If I had run something else, the senators wouldn't have voted for it. So that was a negotiated, here's what we're willing to do. And that's why I took it. But you're, you're right. I, I mean, there are different paths to doing this. But in the end, you've got to, it's got to be enough of an issue with legislators that they want to address it. And I found that, that with, the, with the environment at the time that we had, that that was the best way to get this done in Utah. But it could be different in other states. But I go back to the, to the party path. That results in enthusiasm and getting some grassroots uh, support for it. But it doesn't necessarily result in bills getting passed. I'll add to that in terms of the incremental approach of going city by city. We all are feeling the urgency to do something bolder in our democracy to fix some real problems, and that is ranked choice voting at the state level. Legislators may agree with that urgency, but that doesn't make their process any easier to get a big bill like this through. The value of doing local options language and getting it used in more municipalities and school districts or counties, whatever the case may be, is that you're building not just voter experience, which is key, but you're building the political relationships and the community relationships necessary that carry into and broaden your support at the legislature. Everyone that engages in a local campaign in some way becomes a new round of of advocates for ranked choice voting that you bring to the legislature. They could be local council members, they can be voters, they can be prominent community members, partisan members that you now have built trust with in those communities, and they help build out your coalition. I think the comment that you made that the, you, you, you didn't just go into the legislature, the coalition went into the legislature. When you build out coalitions, locality by locality, you're building friends of the cause. And so that's why ranked choice voting, even local options legislation, which we believe is not enough anymore, honestly, but it is absolutely essential legislation. And if that is what you can get, it's a huge step forward. Um, this was a huge issue for us, was the what is the right balance of how much, how fast. Um, and I think, uh, I'll just use it, I don't think we just went big for it. I think we mostly just went big for it. We did do Benton County first, which ultimately I think was possibly more impactful than it passing anywhere else in the country altogether. Because we, my, I, th I thought I was clever, but like incrementally, other places have already used it for party primaries and it works. Other places have adopted it for general elections, so it works. So there's the increments, now we just pass it because we know it works. Yeah, well it turns out none of that was in Oregon and legislatures didn't buy it because it wasn't in our state, yep. So I was not as clever as I thought. What did work though is tiny little Benton County. Oh, it used there, how'd it go? What do the numbers look like? What does the clerk think? Like everybody asked about that over and over and over again. Um, and I would say that even at one point, uh, and I was shocked to hear this, and it's unlikely that anyone will hear this on any other campaign, I actually had one of our key funders being like, I think you guys might need to slow down. It would be great if you could pass it now, but you could always try again next cycle. And I'm, I'm an idiot, and I was like, no, we're gonna do it this cycle, and then somehow we did. But like, this could, this is likely, you know, Ballot Initiative Strategy Center says it takes about six years on average to bring an issue from concept to the ballot. Um, and at the end of the day, that'll be about that for us. If you don't count Benton County, if you do count Benton County, which you should, we started in 2016. Granted, we took like four years off and didn't do anything about it in between, but you know, that's, that's where this started. Um, also, we had the Portland campaign, so we passed it in the major city in, uh, here. Um, and I think a big part of our worry, and I, I see Colin Cole in the back who, who convinced me that proportional representation was a good idea because I had a very awkward phone call with them. Um, 
where the East Coaster and me came out, and I told him and Georgia at MBD, like, what the bleep are you doing? We need to pass this statewide to affect federal change. What the hell are we doing mucking about in the city level? Well, it turns out I was wrong. Our entire coalition got behind it, and Oregon RCV ended up being one of the biggest funders and on the executive committee, so my mind was changed. Thank you, Colin. Um, but we were incremental in that we went place by place to the statewide. And we did it maybe a little faster than we could, because there's still parts of it that are, might be a little less shaky if we had waited another two years to kind of solidify everything along the way. So you got to be the judge of it in your situation of where to start and how, for how long it's going to take. All right, well, one final round of applause for you and for our panelists. <laughs> and you heard from Jean, you can get in touch with her about her stuff. Um, if you email nathan.lockwood at rankthevote.us with things you'd like to get directed towards our panelist direction, I can make sure they get that way. Or if you connect with them and they give you a better way, that's good too. Thanks so much for coming out today. It's great to see everybody.